Hey, welcome to this new cultural mobility webinar dedicated to the international mobility of disabled artists and cultural professionals, co-funded by the European Union and produced in collaboration with Whole Round. My name is Jon Flock. I'm the director of On the Move. It's a director of operations. Uh, for people with visual impairments, I'm a white man in my mid forties with brown, graying hair. Uh, I'm wearing glasses. I wear a colorful shirt with a beige uh, sweater. Um, today, our conversation will focus on equal access to cross-border mobility and its many opportunities uh, that are yet to be achieved for disabled artists and cultural professionals. Thanks to our wonderful moderators and, and speakers joining us today. This session will therefore allow us to take stock of the situation after the latest initiatives at national, European and international levels, and we'll continue to propose steps to foster change in this area. Your participation today is very welcome. Throughout the webinar, we kindly ask you to please keep your camera and sound turned off for the entirety of the talk. There is a live transcription in English that you can activate at the bottom of the screen or in a separate link shared in the chat. Please feel free to share questions, comments, insights, resources in the chat during the entire conversation. My colleague Marie Le Sour, the uh, Secretary General of On The Move, and uh, my other colleague Bernardo Queiroz, a communications officer, will convey them. And also we will have the time to exchange at the end of this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we invited our dear colleague, uh, Georgie Baltaportolis, to facilitate this webinar. Some of you may know Georgie as a consultant, a researcher, and a trainer in cultural policy and international cultural relation. He is an advisor on culture and sustainable cities at the Committee on Culture of United Cities and Local Governments, the UCLG, and a member of the UNESCO Expert Facility for the Implementation of the 2005 Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Jordi also contributes to the life of many European and international initiatives. And together with John Ellingworth and myself, he co-authored the Time to Act Studies commissioned by the British Council to On the Move as part of the European Beyond Access project. It is now my pleasure to pass the word to Jordi, who will introduce today's conversation and our guest panelist, Jordi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Johan. Thank you very much to On The Move for the invitation, for putting this panel together and for the opportunity to share uh, today's session uh, with uh, with all of you. And I would also uh, like to invite uh, On Sogni, uh, Lisette Reuter and Maria Vlahu to uh, turn on their cameras so that we can uh, start the, the conversation. Uh, my name is uh, Jordi Balta. I'm a, I'm a white man in my late 40s. I've got uh, dark gray hair and I wear glasses. And today I'm wearing a dark blue uh, top. Um, and I'll be I'll be uh, sharing this this session today called the International Mobility of Disabled Artists and Culture Professionals, which is part of the On the Moves uh, Mobility Webinar. Uh, series as and as uh, in the case of other sessions in this uh, series, the aim today is to reflect on the situation of the topic we are addressing today, and particularly the international mobility of disabled artists and cultural professionals. Some of the challenges that we encounter in this uh, context, but also uh, to explore some of the of the good practices and try and formulate some recommendations which can later uh, be hopefully put in practice both by uh, public bodies but also by international networks and uh, other arts organizations uh, the focus today is on the international mobility of uh, disabled artists and culture professionals uh, that of course has to do with the importance that international mobility has for all sorts of artists and culture professionals as part as a, as a, as a core part of their professional development in terms of learning in terms of 
broadening uh, of um, working and learning opportunities in terms of mutual enrichment, in terms of peer learning. I mean, there's uh, many uh, reasons why uh, international mobility is, is important. And at the same time, while we reflect on international mobility, we will, of course, also address uh, challenges and opportunities that exist at the domestic or the national level because uh, they are uh, closely connected. Uh, we are using in this uh, webinar the term uh, disabled artists and culture professionals, and we acknowledge, of course, that there's many uh, different terms that are used to refer to the disabled people or to people with disabilities, and that in different contexts there's different ways of addressing uh, this reality. Uh, on the move uses the term disabled uh, artists, and that's consistent with the work uh, that on the move has done with the time to act uh, uh, series of, of reports that Johan was mentioning earlier. But uh, of course, we acknowledge that in other contexts, there's different terms and they are perfectly valid. As you will see, uh, our speakers, speakers of the panel today might uh, use uh, other terms, both to refer in general to people with disabilities or to uh, artists uh, with disabilities or disabled artists, but also to address the diversity of forms of disability and impairment that exist in this in this case. And hopefully in the course of the session, we will be able to uh, see uh, reflect on on this uh, diversity of of cases. Uh, we have a, a, a very rich and interesting uh, set of uh, panelists today, and I will briefly uh, introduce them. Uh, um, with us today is uh, Maria Vlahu, who's a founding member and the executive director of Acceso Cultura, uh, an organization based in Portugal. She's the author of uh, several books, including What Have We Got to Do with, with It? The Political Role of Cultural Organizations and Musing on Culture, Management, Communication, and Our Relationship with People. And she's also the author of the, bil the bilingual blog uh, Musing on Culture. In the past, she was Communications Director of the Sao Luis Municipal uh, Theater and Head of Communication of the Pavilion of Knowledge, Ciencia Viva in uh, Lisbon. She's, uh, she was a board member of ICOM in Portugal and the editor of its bulletin between 2005 and 2014. And she's collaborated with different programs of the Clus de Gulbenkian Foundation. She's uh, a fellow of the International Society uh, for the Performing Arts, and she's taken part in several uh, international initiatives and uh, training programs. Uh, with us today, uh, as well is uh, On Sogni, who's the country director for Epic Arts and an Obama leader, uh, Epic Arts in Cambodia and an Obama leader. And she uh, has over 14 years of experience uh, to advocate for Cambodians with uh, disability. She pioneers uh, inclusion in the arts, empowering marginalized individuals through creative experience. Uh, Sogni also serves as an advisor to the Cambodian Ministry of Fine Arts and Culture where she utilizes arts, inclusive education, community work, and social enterprise to drive uh, positive uh, change. Uh, she actively engages with policymakers, promoting inclusive policies that underscore the critical role of culture and arts in Cambodia's equitable development. And her passion lies in cultivating uh, leaders committed to serving people with disabilities and advancing social inclusion in their communities. And last but, but not least is uh, Lisette Reuter, who uh, since 2006 works as project manager, trainer, curator, and consultant in the international inclusive art and cultural sector. She's the founder and executive director of the social enterprise Unlabel, based in Cologne, Germany. As an expert on inclusion, uh, Lisette advises and accompanies cultural stakeholders and organizations throughout Europe in the field of accessibility and equal participation. She's a bridge builder and a border crosser. She's a coach, a project developer, and a master of networks. Her head and her approach is always border crossing in every aspect. She sees inclusion not as a social project, but as a matter of course, and as a normal part uh, of art. So uh, having uh, done this uh, set of presentations, I think it's very much the time to uh, give them the floor. Um, and um, I would um, 
ask uh, Maria Sogni and, and Lisette to um, who, I mean, as you've seen in their profiles, they have uh, an extensive experience in supporting uh, disabled artists at national and, and international level and who also work in very diverse, uh, different contexts. Uh, I would like to, to ask them, first of all, to introduce themselves uh, visually for the audience, but also uh, if they could tell us uh, what are some of the main challenges faced by disabled artists uh, that they identify in the in the contexts where where they are? And this would be the first the first round. I'll, I'll first give the floor to Maria, then Sogni, and then uh, Lisette. And uh, you can start, Maria, when you want. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, hello, Lisette and Sogni. I'm a white woman in uh, her fifties. I have uh, shoulder high straight, light brown hair, green eyes, I'm dressed, I have a black sweater and white shirt. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Uh, Ases Cultura is an association of cultural professionals based in Portugal, and we reached out to, uh, to the disabled um, artists with whom we normally collaborate. And the first point I would like to bring up uh, is that one of them told us, great, this, all, this is all about mobility, but please think about opportunities for artists who cannot travel. That said, um, a number of other points we would like to share with you. Um, really, the first one is it doesn't make a difference if it is a national or international level, it's all the same. And uh, the first one, perhaps the basis of everything is lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge of what the specific artists uh, the specific needs of disabled artists are, uh, lack of knowledge as to what, what constitutes a barrier actually, uh, and how we can solve or adapt in order to create uh, access conditions uh, for disabled uh, artists. Then another point that is probably associated to our lack of knowledge is lack of empathy. Because when we don't understand certain issues, we tend to think that disabled artists are being difficult or spoiled. And one thing I think, believe is related to the other. Uh, some other issues that um, uh, come up uh, is um, lack of good communication, lack of answers to emails. And that can be particularly stressful uh, for a disabled artist that has to think in advance before traveling on a number of, um, of specific conditions. So lack of answer to emails, uh, the contract is not being sent on time, payments are not made in time, and this is actually uh, quite stressful. Um, then, of course, transport and whoever has a family member or a colleague uh, with disability knows what it means to travel by plane and the horrible stories that um, keep coming up. Uh, so it is important that these bookings are not left for the last moment, as it often happens. Um, that we consider carefully transfers. And uh, then it's access itself, because many times uh, wh when we organize something, uh, we think about the main venue of the event, and then we don't think about other venues like the hotel, like public transport in the city uh, where we are, like restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, a couple of artists, were quite clear about the lack of adequate communication before when we are organizing everything, either with themselves, the artists, or with their personal assistant. There are issues of um, lack of access backstage, dressing rooms, uh, toilets, showers. Um, and then um, also related to our lack of knowledge schedules. Um, the pauses, the um, exhaustion, uh, the time a disabled artist might need in order to um, keep their body in a, in a good condition. And the time it takes many times to do certain things that some artists call creep time. Uh, so it's not the same. We cannot plan uh, a residency or a show or a performance uh, without taking into careful consideration the specific uh, needs of disabled artists. So just to conclude, um, together with the artists that talk to us and our experience, we think it is fundamental to consider um, training in this field for cultural professionals. And actually the Time to Act report was a trigger for us to create a seminar for producers 
um, when working with artists, uh, disabled artists, then access riders. For instance, we have one in English and one in Portuguese, and they can be, um, it can be the artists sending them to sending their access rider to the uh, organization they're going to work with, or it can be the initiative of the organization when they know they're going to work with a disabled artist to send the access rider so the, um, the, the artist can give them feedback. And then always to evaluate, ask for feedback after the event has taken place. Two quick notes. One artist who told us in Finland, I felt I was seen as a person. And another artist who told us, I've shared all these issues with you, but in Brazil, especially in the big cities, this was not an issue. Um, access conditions have been taken care of uh, in many cultural organizations in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for this comprehensive uh, review and for bringing in the voices of uh, many, many disabled artists and their, their experience. Uh, Sokni, uh, would, you, would you like to share some of the challenges uh, that you encounter in your context? Thank you. Thank you, Marion and Jody. And hello, Lisetta and a whole room here with us, um, with me. I'm honored to be here with you. Um, I am... Uh, a woman, Asian woman, uh, brown skin. I have uh, black curly hair and I'm wearing the red top. Um, and also myself is a woman with disability as well. I'm so honored to be here um, with everyone here in the room. And uh, for me, it was so surprised to um, introduce by visual. That is something the first time I have an experience because Cambodia is just such a different way of uh, access, um, disability accessibility. So there's a good practice for me to learn online when we introduce ourselves, which is something that I learned from it straight away. And I'm here today um, also um, to listen, to learn, but also to be your ally together. And of course, um, I learned a lot from our panel here, but also it's good to um, thank you for listening to my uh, issue in Cambodia, uh, science well for disability artists. And I really, um, uh, sharing the same comment like Marion had mentioned already about the challenge and we face such a quite similar challenging I was cut right to the uh, three or four or five different cut right about the challenges we face in Cambodia but also international as well quite similar um, one of those is funding for the arts it's quite a lack of the funding for the art if we talk about Cambodia contact um, it's, um, uh, we don't have a national funding for the art. We have to find our funding from our own projects or our own works um, or different donors. We have uh, an art, you know, art um, uh, partnership that we work with that provide funding, but it's not kind of specifically to access for people with disabilities. So we have to be put ourselves in mainstream to get there but sometimes they need quite a lot of access to be able to access to that funding. Um, other one is a market for artists with disability. The art market is really low here in Cambodia. We not quite, um, we don't have a public space for, for us to go perform or sell tickets or regular performance or uh, generate income. The art space, uh, either we have to rent it out and do it the event, or we have to do our own cell in our own center here. And most likely connected with it, the art space is very inaccessible for us to go perform. So it always add on when we are on a stage, which is kind of, for Cambodia is kind of great um, initiative to make, work it out with the resource we have, but also sometimes it, um, feel like uh, to add on. So it's sometimes not complete design for the accessibility, accessible for people, people with disability or artists with disability. Pay scale, that is something that um, in general, I mean, in, in Cambodia, artists have to work in different jobs to be able to keep doing what they do. Um, if we talk about artists with disability in Cambodia, what the experience is, the pay scale is quite, quite low. And um, the artists we work with us here, we cannot, uh, they cannot work at the other place because it's not much access opportunity for the job outside, outside 
epic artwork. So we we fortunate enough to employ our artists for full time job. But apart from our place, uh, it's quite hard to find another job for artists with disability because the access need and understanding about the um, arts and culture with disability. Um, the other one is education and knowledge, like Marion had mentioned. Um, the artists that we're working with in general, in general education in disability sector in Cambodia is quite low. People with disability really hard to access to education because of accessibility at school. So the artists that we're working with most likely they not know how to read or write. So also they don't even know how to do the sign language themselves who are hearing impairment. So we start from scratch a lot. We have to uh, work with them from very the beginning um, in terms of access to information, learning their own sign language, but also teaching uh, literacy numbers and stuff like that to be able for them to basic uh, access to information. So the knowledge, artist knowledge, uh, it's quite lack in terms of uh, access to information or get to know more information out there in the world uh, or even in the, in the country it's still still hard so we need to support a lot and we work together support a lot to share that information to other artists and um, art space that I mentioned already the, the market uh, for the art disability but also in general art space there's not such a thing that start to think about accessibility for the art space so when we uh, work with um, when we work with the public space in Cambodia or the private space in Cambodia, we in the same time we have to advocate for that to be able for us uh, to go and perform or advocate for um, uh, the right spot for the sign translator to sign for our deaf dancer. So we have to um, in a way it's a good advocate advocate on as a national and, and local in general, but uh, we have to put up a lot of um, prepare and work and make sure our artists don't feel like they're not being sought, sought, sought through about their needs. So we, we have to work a lot on emotional support and also work a lot on accessibility support for them. And um, the last one is the the other one is quite hard and we, that's what we actually fighting for every day is a mindset. Mindset about people with disability and about artists with disability. In Cambodia, uh, knowledge about um, disability awareness is quite low. It doesn't mean they don't, they doesn't want to understand that, but the education and awareness raising its limits. So the information quite lacks of that. So we have to do a mindset uh, we have to do a lot of mindset changing or advocate for mindset change from, from the negative thought to the positive thinking about uh, artists with disability, especially when down into contemporary dance um, uh, a platform that where, where our team is, it's quite uh, interesting approach that how the audience in Cambodia take on about the, the the, the, the art form because the contemporary dam also quite a new one as well. And on top of that, we are uh, uh, artists with different disability uh, performance. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of top picture challenge on the stage, but it's a good way to put it out there, advocate for talented and the professionalism for artists with disability. Um, the last one is policy because, you know, Cambodia uh, Ministry of Fine art and cultures, it's very uh, supportive and very want to bring to make sure that the mainstream the art in Cambodia. But although the policy it started in 2014, it's a bit long time ago, and uh, uh, a lot of aspects that miss out in terms of um, integrated with inclusive, uh, you know, visibility inclusion or disability art inclusion then in the sector of the policy it wasn't that main, mentioned that well so it's still need a lot to do to promote diversity of art in the policy a little bit more in Cambodia and to sum up in general we work out what we have and available resource in Cambodia uh, uh, in terms of uh, artists and diversity in art 
uh, we turn around to the place sometime under the tree, we have to put a mat on and perform, or sometimes a lot of stair, we have to make sure one of our team are ready to carry our artists on top the stair. So we try much, as much as we could in our lack of resource, but at the same time, we're trying to mainstream our work within the, the, the mainstream context of arts and culture which is kind of good, um, a good advocate in general that uh, Cambodia kind of start to accept the new dance, new dance form in inclusive dance group. And also in the same time, they start to talk about the talent of the artists, which I think that's a good advocate that we have a long way to go, but that's how we do it in the smaller resource we have. And for the international um, level, I think almost the same similar situation but probably in terms of education and access to funding, probably better than, than Cambodia, that from my understanding. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sogni, for introducing say, a range, a range of, of topics uh, ranging from the accessibility at venue level to the broader aspects of social man mindsets and, and how these also translates into policy and and funding. Uh, we're now, we'll now give the floor to, to Lisette. And Lisette, there's many things that have already been said, but hopefully you have uh, some others to, to add or just to reinforce some of the things that, that uh, Sogmi and, and Maria have uh, shared. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, to introduce myself, I'm a 44-year-old Central European white woman with blonde curly long hair going over my shoulders and today I'm wearing like a roll neck jumper, a black one and I have blue eyes and my sign language name if somebody is also in the audience who is deaf is like the L of Lisette at the curly hairs. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, issues already tackled from Maria and Sogni, but I would like to add that um, I see one of the biggest challenges really like the lack of budget in this traditional cultural funding programs, um, because the cost for accessibility uh, must then usually be taken from the production budget. And as Unlabel started as a performing arts company, this was really our biggest challenge in the past also um, doing our international big production projects um, funded by Creative Europe and Erasmus Plus. And we, we always faced like a huge reach problem to get the budget for accessibility costs together. And this leads every um, company who's working mixed abled inclusive in like a disadvantaged position to every other companies. Um, who do not work inclusively because they have to take the budget from the normal production costs and there are no additional costs where you can apply for. And it's interesting because in Germany, this is changing a little bit since the last two years, I would say. So funding organizations are more aware, but still, for example, in North Rhine-Westphalia, we have uh, the possibility to ask for another 5,000 euros for additional costs for accessibility costs. If you think about working with deaf artists in a production and you need sign language translators for a six week production time, you need 30,000 and not 5,000, you know? So this is really like one of the biggest challenge. Um, and for example, um, there, is finally or hardly no country except UK um, where you have like this access to work uh, program, which is really wonderful in UK. And the access to work program um, provides um, financial support uh, to help individuals and not only employees, because in, in a lot of countries you have the possibility if you are employed to ask for support money but not for individuals, so not for freelancing artists. And I think this is really one of the biggest challenges. And uh, with this access to work scheme from UK, also freelancing artists, freelancing independent people um, can ask for support. And um, they are supporting not only specialized equipment, but they are only also supporting travel expenses um, and support workers. And especially support workers are really needed when you work 
mixed ables in productions. Um, another challenge I say is that there's hardly any access to state training opportunities and to education programs from art universities. Um, and in Germany, for example, just to give you a number, um, there are only six tr professional trained actors and dancers studied on a state university in the whole country until now. There are, of course, a lot of um, private initiatives, um, actor schools uh, where you can be trained, but this um, state educational system is not accessible. And this leads to another pro a problem because a lot of state theaters, city theaters, they are only working with professional trained artists from state uh, university programs, you know, so they are saying we would like to have like disabled um, artists in our ensembles, but there is nobody out there. So I think really one of the main key points is that we have to start with our educational systems and the situation in Germany is not so different to the most other countries I know in, in Europe. Um, and I can just confirm what Maria said, and I think this is really the biggest, biggest challenge, um, the lack of knowledge um, among cultural stakeholders um, about inclusion, accessibility, not only about the needs of the artist, but also about the needs of the audience. And I think this is really where we also have the, the best chance to work on altogether, because it's about giving training, about giving um, the possibility to find the knowledge. There is a lot of knowledge out there, but people need to know where to find it and they need to invest in being trained and educated. So um, as I'm looking a bit on the time, I think <laughs> I will make a point here. Excellent. Thank you very much also, uh, Lisette, for this uh, initial introduction to some of the challenges you, you see. And, and as you will have seen over the, the contributions of Maria Sogni and, and Lisette, uh, there's, there's a wide range of challenges that are observed. I mean, many which have to do with aspects related to information, knowledge, awareness, raising uh, education with, uh, interestingly, ECHO. Uh, one of the main focus of the of the time to act reports, which were commissioned by the British Council to on the move in the context of Europe beyond access and which you can access via the information that has been shared in the in the chat, but also uh, we've we've encountered many other aspects and of course, many of those can be addressed through information and knowledge, but we've also we've also seen access related to the accessibility of both. Uh, venues for uh, artistic work, but also the many other infrastructures that are relevant in terms of uh, international mobility, uh, then many other things that are relevant at the domestic or the national level in terms of uh, adapting uh, policies and funding programs and recognizing the specific needs which relate to accessibility and which mean that, uh, as, as uh, some of you are saying, potentially artists with disabilities can be disadvantaged particularly disadvantage when that specificity is not uh, recognized and then there's broader aspects related to the uh, to the mindsets and the perception of disabled artists in the minds of people and and to what extent we can change that to a, to a recognition of the of the value and the the right of a disabled artist to pursue a career as well and what that means also in terms of adapting uh, policies and, and programs so we've we've seen a wide range of of difficulties and and, and challenges and now uh, in order to be uh, to adopt a more constructive uh, role of course uh, uh, the, the the participants in the panel today also have uh, solutions or at least they have in their own work they have developed programs and activities that have tried and address some of these uh, challenges so so I would like now to to give the floor back uh, to them we'll start with with Sogni now and uh, ask them if they can share uh, an example of a project or an initiative in which they have been involved and in which some of these challenges have been uh, addressed. So, uh, Sogni, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, epic, epic art, we believe in, in the art as a way of to, to, 
transform, but also to the, say the message, spread the message about the issue, social issue we have. So um, we uh, created in 2006 based on the one of the founders uh, who she, she is a dancer and also her father also is people person with disability from UK. So the art is the soul of the organizations as it whole. So we have three programs that are running every day here in, in the organization. We have the, uh, it, we call it inclusive education program, which is that the, uh, one of the uh, education uh, in under the education program is inclusive art course, because we provide the education for youth with disability from 18 to 35, because it's hard to, um, to identify the age of uh, 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 children with disability or the youth with disability. So they joined with us a two year course to learn different skill in, in, in dance, drama and visual art. Um, we've been run it in 2000, since 2009 and that is quite intensive course. Uh, full-time two years and uh, we provide the accommodation also the uh, stipend for, for uh, youth with disability uh, to be able to you know um, uh, for them for living for while they uh, uh, have to live with us but those uh, the each each generation have been changed a little bit because the job market need as well you know we've been running for five generation now the last generation lately we run in 2003, there was we adapt our sketch, adapt our curriculum a little bit because the job needed for the market needs. So we change slightly, be uh, just dance purely to a dance, the arts and hospitality skill. Because we also know that we find out that the youth with disability when they join with us through the process of selection. Um, after they experience with dance and drama, they also doesn't want to be a dancer. So our jobs not force them to be a dancer. Our job to explore and be a bridge for them to explore what they want to be. So the program is tailor uh, based on needed of the youth with disability within in the center that we have. So that one of the program that could produce the new artists to join our dance performance team that we also have our own group called Epic Arts Dance Company. They are the professional dancer, but also they came from the inclusive art course since 2009 until now. So we generate the new generations each course when they graduate. Um, in, this, in this sense that because the uh, when they join with us, there's a lot of needed support within the family, within the access, within the budget, but also at the same time within emotional support. Because the inclusive DN, it's not just only um, provide them skill, but also the place for them to explore what they want to be, but also explore their potential and build their confidence as well. So some of them, sometimes when they graduate, they got a different job, uh, not being an artist, or they become in quite a... Um, a well-known visual art, or they have their own shop um, created related with their talented. So that what is something we 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 really trying to do for tellers the the need of uh, youth with disability who need the support or who want to be explored in arts um, and the dance being a dancer. But also to say that so the like I mentioned from the beginning, the uh, contemporary dance in company quite new. So the, the trainer is actually from UK. That's what we're working with, with the teacher, the choreographer from UK to work with the, with the artists here. So we, we're fortunate to have um, different teachers and choreographer come and work with us in long term, like every two years. And then we might be have the same uh, teacher or maybe change different, but um, we find that it uh, more effective because the uh, higher proper skill from the teacher from UK than what we find in Cambodia. So our artists who explore and expose with the new different way of contemporary done with the trainer from the UK. 
that one of the you know program we have but also on our side we have the epic art cafe i know that's not a it's not an artist but also hospitality is a way that also to um, create a job for uh, uh, disability who are not interested in art but they want to work in a restaurant so that job opportunity creating for people with disability within our organization and of course, like I mentioned already, the DEM the team, the company, they are uh, six of them and they uh, have different type of diversity in the group. And they perform in different social issues related with Cambodia. And, but at the same time, when they perform, and they advocate for disability inclusion through the art. So they perform in, in national and international uh, to um, different, different uh, 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 vegetable but also the partnership as well in 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 the country we work with international uh, school to work with it's explored with the theme also social inclusion so that how a way we advocate wider theme outside the organization work as well through the con uh, the end company and overall overall we we promote the um the percentage of people with disability in organization we have a uh, 54 staff together probably quite small for compared to other but uh, 70 percent of those are people with disability that we're working with um and we play such a we're trying to be up our game in terms of like um uh, being part of different networking of arts networking, general arts and culture networking in Cambodia, they're actually not such a thing specific for disability networking, artists with disability networking in Cambodia. So we not have any other platform apart from just general uh, art networking in Cambodia. So we found it more interested internationally in terms of if we want to uh, explore our um, you know, opportunity or uh, increase our skill on disability inclusion and art, we, we're looking for international. In the countries, quite a little bit of lack of opportunity at the moment. So that I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophni, for sharing your, your experience. And uh, Lisette, the, the floor is now yours to, to share uh, some of your experiences. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to give you a little insight in our three-year access major uh, access maker project, which uh, we launched exactly three years ago. So we are in the final two weeks <laughs> writing the reports and everything. Um, but so what we did, we focused with Access Maker on the support of three large city theaters in our region. So Düsseldorfer Schauspielhaus is like a state. Theater, Theater Dortmund is like huge theater with an opera house inside, um, children and youth theater. So it's like a five Spaten house, it's called in Germany. So five genres. So really large um, theaters and a children and youth theater in, in Cologne over here. And we focused for three years on the inclusive opening process with workshops, um, seminars, training programs, production um, supervising. So we really joined their productions and supervised on the artistic um, process on accessibility and um, inclusion. And we also offered for every interested uh, cultural actor in Germany free cost um, telephone advice and online advice and um, so-called creative labs, uh, which are four days uh, really intensive um, training courses with international experts. So we invited more than 20 international experts to our creative labs and we reached out to over 140 um, participants in this creative labs. We also, yeah, somehow focused on, on smaller groups to have like really an intensive um, training. And um, I think one of the main points was that we always focused on all um, areas of culture. So we looked into the program, the audience, the staff, a PR and the partner. So we always had like all these different areas of culture in mind and try to make all the areas more accessible and more inclusive. 
And the idea of the whole project came um, because of our own experience as a touring performing arts company. Because we were touring on national and international level um, and we always encountered the inexperience and the lack of knowledge um, of the stuff um, in theaters, of especially also of the leaders um, and um, heads of big cultural organizations. Um, but we also faced um, the fact that there was always like a really great willingness to go on this learning journey and um so we we always got the feedback it didn't matter if we performed at the national opera in athens or at an opera here in germany or at a festival in sweden uh, we always um, got the feedback that they learned so much from the work with mixed abled um, performing arts group and that the diversity we brought on stage and we brought in this working em environment was really enriching, not only for the audience, but also for the staff in the, in the cultural organization. So, and this um, was like the basic idea why I created the concept for Access Maker, because I said like, yeah, there is like this huge lack and we have to do something um, to, to train the cultural organizations. And if I look now to the numbers of the three-year project, it's really um, exciting because um, the three theaters we advised really closely over the three years, they created more than 20 performances, which are accessible, um, and they didn't do it before. Uh, four of them um, are created with uh, aesthetic of access. Uh, which was a completely new field for, for the big theaters. And it was really exciting because you have to work artistically completely different. Um, so we reached out with these productions to over more than 35,000 audience members. Um, and we trained more than 1,400 um, employees from the theaters and um, other cultural actors in, in Germany. And we always trained with a tandem team of disabled, um, either just disabled cultural workers or a tandem team of disabled worker and non-disabled um, cultural workers. So 80% of our coaches, of our trainers, are cultural workers with disability. So this is also like a big step. And we are facing a lack of good trained cultural workers with disabilities who can train cultural organizations. So what is the next step now for us is to set up a training program for cultural workers with disabilities who are, um, who are going to be um, trained to, to give the advice to the cultural organizations. And um, so what we also realized that through this big project, Access Maker, we are getting so many requests from all over Germany. So starting from the Goethe Institution to the big city theaters, to operas, small companies, small um, individual uh, groups, who really starting to, to work more inclusive and they all need training. So um, the request is just um, so huge that we can't really offer everybody the, the training courses because we don't just have the resources. And we just had uh, last week our final um, gathering um, for this program and what is really great that um, we will get much more support from the federal state and from the region and from some sponsors to scale up this project on national level so um, and this is um, for me like really the step where um, yeah so I think there's a rethinking also in the policy, um, in the cultural sector of policymakers, that they are now starting to support this kind of projects and that they um, see um, that they need to promote sustainable um, capacity building projects to 
or which are um, able to, to train people. And this wasn't the situation three years ago when we started Access Maker. So it was really hard to find the budget for it. And now everybody is so keen in funding this project, which is nice, of course. Um, and so I really see also a big change um, in among cultural organizations that they also invest time, that they invest money, that they invest resources. Um, and they really want to initiate a transformation process. And um, what I, and I think the situation is not different in other European countries, but when I look to the dimension of diversity in the cultural sector, people with disability were always coming the last so there were a lot of programs focusing on migration, LGBTQ, et cetera, but people with disability were always the last. And this is changing. So I really have the feeling now it's time to, to start. And a lot of people do have the willingness and they see the, the huge need to, to do something. And maybe to add also on this project, um, what is nice, so I said already, so the request on training is so huge. And this gave us as a company also the possibility to um, have another business model as a performing arts company. Because, of course, we are also um, gaining some money with our services. So we, first of all, we can put it back to our artistic programs. But it's also like a security for job, job opportunities for disabled cultural workers. So and this is really a nice thing which goes along this, this project. So I think it's a really sustainable um, um, concept. And um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a great possibility for artists with disability um, to train others and also to, to, to raise some income of training others so yeah i think this is like the example i wanted to share excellent thank you thank you very much lizette for sharing your your experience and the work you've been doing in recent years and we'll now give the floor to to maria to share also your your own uh, practice thank you so as i said in the beginning we are an association of cultural professionals and cultural organizations and since the beginning um, i think that our core business was training uh, specifically directed to cultural professionals and consultancy. Um, I think I share Lizette's view that uh, there's much more awareness at this point. If we consider 10 years ago when the association was created and the 10 years before that, that we were an informal group working in the field, it's totally different. I wouldn't say though, and Portugal is a small country, that in terms of practice, putting theory into practice, we can have such... Uh, uh, impressive results, but there's a core group of cultural professionals and cultural organizations that are actually investing uh, on access. Uh, in these training programs and consultancy, of course, uh, uh, some of the colleagues that are involved are people with disabilities who, who are consultants uh, as well. Um, our most recent program that I think it's worth mentioning, it's called All Areas Access. It's a Creative Europe, um, um, it's, uh, it's fun by Creative Europe. I could actually put here the link on our chat. And um, it, is, um, it involves Portuguese, Italian and Belgian partners. And we work on making live concerts more accessible to deaf audiences, which is very exciting. It's a whole new world opening up. Uh, and of course, with deaf performance on stage as well. Um, apart from that, and yes, we are investing heavily on this. I mean, lack of knowledge, we said it in the beginning, it's, it's probably the cause of the first barriers. It's the basis of the bar barriers. It's our sector's lack of knowledge. And maybe I could share three small episodes with you um, so that we have an idea of how things then happen in practice. Some years ago, we invited uh, a British colleague from an organization called Attitude is Everything, that they're, they're also working on uh, making live concerts uh, accessible to disabled people in general. It was the first time we saw an access rider. Our colleague, once we invited them, she sent us her access rider. And remember, I remember the first thing on that access rider was, no one will pick me up. 
and that was of course with us no one would pick anybody up but it was very important and as i said uh, and i would repeat it now on our website uh, you may find a basis in english and in portuguese of what an access writer can be and then each artist um, adapts it to their needs um then uh, uh, recently we had a colleague from latvia over she's also a member of uh, our association and uh, you can't imagine or maybe you can how difficult it was to find an accessible hotel uh, especially because many hotels once they are contacted they will confirm that they're accessible and they're not either because uh, it's not understood what accessibility means or because they assume that all disabled people have the same needs and the two wheelchair users do not move the same way do not have the same needs so it is important also uh, to understand what uh, what it means to be accessible. Then we had the chance to visit with her a number of places, a number of cultural venues we have worked with as consultants so that she could see the kind of work that was uh, undertaken. But again, there were so many others that uh, we could not uh, visit uh, either because of transport issues or because the venues themselves were not accessible. And then of course, choosing a restaurant to go out for dinner. It's extremely, I mean, it's such a stressful <laughs> experience, uh, first of all, to find a restaurant and then also to find a restaurant with an adapted bathroom, uh, restroom. Uh, sometimes they're one thing, but they're not the other. Um, and then the third uh, experience I would like to share is that a few months ago, we were, um, we were going to speak in a literary festival. And uh, one of the colleagues invited was a writer, uh, a writer who has um, a condition that is called uh, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. I think in English it's the brittle bone disease. It's called. Um, anyway, she's a, a woman of a low stature. Uh, her members are short, and um, her bones um, are quite fragile. Uh, we are invited to go on stage, all speakers. The, um, the chairs were made of plexiglass, uh, plastic, let's say, and nobody had thought um, that she, she would sleep because of her clothes also and the material of the chair, she would sleep on that. She couldn't hold herself on that. So in front of everybody and an audience full of young people, her assistant picked her up. I mean, she's an adult woman picked her up as if she was a baby and everybody watching and trying to find a solution at that moment. Uh, so this is totally avoidable. It's not respectful. It's a total humiliation for many of the disabled artists we work with. And it's avoidable if we use access riders and if we have the curiosity and the openness to treat each person as a person and find out what their specific needs are. On the other hand, a week ago, I think it was a week ago, the Metropolitan Museum organized a debate, which is available online. They have an exhibition called um, Women Dressing Women, and they organized a debate where Sinead Burke, um, a British activist, took place, uh, took part, I'm sorry. Uh, Sinead is a woman of small stature, or she calls herself a little person. And uh, just watching that on that stage before the speakers came in, I saw a small stool in front of one of the chairs. So Sinead got on stage on her own, got on the chair on her own, and had some support for her legs while she was participating in the in the debate. Um, so that would be my 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 last point here. Each person is a person. There is a basic knowledge we should have. We should look for it. Uh, and then, of course, adapt to the specific needs of, um, of each person. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Maria. And after, after listening to, to all of you, and let's say in the, in the first part of the discussion, we were focusing quite a lot on, on issues of information and knowledge. And, and I think by presenting your experiences, what comes up quite clearly is that uh, each in your own context, you very much operate as learning organizations that basically have observed what are the difficulties and what are the challenges and you've interacted with others. And, and then on the basis of that, you've really designed uh, activities that respond and, and are very tailored to that kind of, of, um, of challenges. And that at the same time try and be and be sustainable, whether it's by fostering uh, the building of capacities, by uh, helping to transform infrastructures, by uh, providing employment opportunities, somehow trying 
at at your own scale to try and and address those, those systemic uh, difficulties. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be uh, opening uh, the floor for questions for the audience, and and indeed. As it has been said in the chat, if anyone has questions, do feel free to share them there. But before uh, opening uh, to, to questions, I would like to to um, to share a final question for for the speakers, and and I'll try and I'll ask you to try and be brief here. Maybe if you can speak in say about three four minutes maximum, that would be ideal. Uh, it's it's now time to try and and formulate recommendations or ideas for uh, what should be the next steps. I mean, some of you have already hinted at uh, things that have moved, things that you are advocating for. So thinking of policies and thinking also in terms of networking for organizations like On The Move, what could be the priorities uh, in the in the near future? I'll, I'll first give the floor to Lisette uh, in, in this, this time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's again the same. We have to build up the knowledge also from funding organizations. And um, this is the basis for everything. And what we did with uh, Unlabel during the pandemic, um, we, we had the chance to um, set up this project United Inclusion. And the base was um, built on the report Disability Artists in the Mainstream, um, a new cultural agenda for Europe, which some of you might know. Otherwise, it, it's really good to look it up. And what we did, so we, we created online seminars with funders from the different levels. So federal, state level, regional, um, the community level, but also private foundations, private sponsors. And um, we put them together with cultural workers with disabilities, again, in these online seminars, to be trained by the cultural um, workers and artists and to learn about the needs um, about um, accessibility for artists, but also for the audience. And what came out, it was the first time that policymakers and decision makers from big foundations um, got in dialogue with people with disabilities. So, and we created a really safe space um, and a good atmosphere that the, um, that the decision makers could ask all the question they always wanted to raise and ask. And it came out, they had no idea about costs, accessibility costs. Um, most of them didn't know about the cost for a sign language translator by hour, for example. Um, and it's the result of this project is like a guideline, which is also free of charge. And we created it somehow together with funders. And it's a guideline how you have to change the funding system um, to become more, ex so that the funding system is becoming more accessible um, for artists with um, disability, but also, of course, um, for all cultural organizations and to become more accessible also for, for the audience. And since um, this program, we can really see like a change in the design and, and concept of a lot of funding programs in Germany. So they are thinking now about accessibility costs. So um, they are including rows in the budget lines, for example, about accessibility costs. And this is like a major change. So, but it's again about um, creating a space where you can get in dialogue and where they can learn from each other um, and where you also can build up trust. I think trust is really important and we can only, um, we can only reach uh, a, a huge change if we go on this learning journey together. So we have to learn from each other. And um, so I think this is the most important for policymakers as well to um, to listen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisette. Uh, Maria, your turn. So yes, I'll try to be brief. Um, of course, the first thing as a recommendation is invest on training, invest on our lack of knowledge and try to 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 deal with this issue that is actually uh, basic. 
um, then uh, uh, fund access adaptations, which in most countries would mean comply by the law, nothing else, comply by the law. Um, and then also uh, to, to link to what Lisette was saying, uh, and the report she mentioned, disabled artists in the mainstream is quite clear, it's short and clear, uh, is uh, fund the extra costs of disability, know what they are and fund the extra costs of disability with a dedicated budget. Because otherwise it's up to each company to decide, do I wish to invest on access or not? And then many times they don't wish to take out from other things in order to invest in access. And maybe a last point, because I was remembering the, um, our conversation last year when the second part of um, uh, Time to Act was launched, um, let disabled artists work on their art. They are not the consultants. It is very often that our artists go to different places, different venues to do the work, and there's always somebody who says, oh, it's a good thing you're here. Let's take a walk around the venue uh, to see if we're okay in terms of access. That's not the artist's job to do. Let them concentrate on their art and look for consultants, disabled, not disabled. Look for consultants in what uh, relates to access. Thank you. Yeah, thanks indeed, uh, Maria, for highlighting these uh, key uh, elements. Uh, Sokni. Uh, what would be your points? Thank you. Um, so all good points already. I only have sought, um, three sort of points. Is the first one is about the access funding for artists with disability should be barrier by country. I think that is important because if you put the country as a barrier, it's gonna be uh, kind of you less behind artists in other country with disabilities and no access to it. And the other one I think is the uh, global network. Like today, it's a, such a great evidence that we come together from different country, understand each other, um, talented works and or challenge. I think it's a great way to go that we should come together as a global and you even I not not know what to call, but uh, that's great if you have space to come together to share our strengths, weakness, and challenge we face. Um, so then we uh, we could uh, learn a lot from each other, and at the same time we uh, become as one way we fight we fight for it. Um, and the last one I think is um, I uh, agree with Maria that it should be a better policy for artists with disability, especially including access costs for uh, uh, artists with disability. That's not, I know it's gonna be a long, long way to go for uh, for the country policy here, but uh, it's, it's great to have the international policy have that so we can learn from that experience and best practice. I think we will advocate for that and now. At the moment in in last the last message that we have I have at the moment in Cambodia access, I would just say uh, accessibility is that from the heart at the moment because that we don't have much in resource but people around support it to make it access. That's a Cambodia contact from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sokni. And I think we, we have quite a, a wide range of, of elements to work on. Uh, indeed, as it, as it has been said, uh, I mean, the, the focus on, on knowledge is something that, that we also uh, found in, in, the, in the Time to Act report. And one of the points that was made there was there's often a lot of knowledge that is already out there, whether it's in guides, in toolkits, uh, in the knowledge of people that have had the experience. And at the same time, uh, often this is not sufficiently uh, well known. And of course, that's also one of the areas in which international networking and uh, whether it's at the European level or at broader global level can, can make a difference in facilitating a lot of knowledge that is out there and also through uh, the practice of those projects, also facilitating the, the addressing of those, of those issues. Um, I don't know if um, uh, it, uh, I've, I've been seeing some some comments uh, popping up in the in the chat, and I don't know, uh, Johan uh, or uh, Marie, if um, there's any any questions that you've collected, or if uh, we should give the floor to someone in case. Yes, uh, I can questions. now. Yeah, Johan. 
I can uh, just uh, share that. Uh, I mean, thank you already for all the 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 input that uh, you've all uh, you've all uh, uh, shared in in the in the chat. We see many resources have have been shared, uh, including by the speakers or on the projects you were you were uh, mentioning. And um, I would say that we will probably prepare an info sheet. Uh, with all the resources and all the links so that will be published and available on on the move website um, in the coming days because all the examples are so rich and and this is one thing that comes quite clearly from the conversation the needle has moved uh from the time to act report and from the many initiatives that were launched years ago we see that many many projects many initiatives took place and there is a, a clear awareness raised uh, um, uh, in the in the conversation um, uh, in the chat we had uh, several uh, comments and questions i'm going to bring uh, one that is echoing uh, what um, on sokni was uh, mentioning about the international network uh, um, the one by uh, chiara alborino uh, who is a contemporary choreographer and dancer and she was commenting that um, um, uh, as um, as a, a professional based in uh, Italy and co-founder of um, the Scuola Elementare del Teatro di Napoli, uh, she was uh, working on inclusion uh, uh, issues for disabled artists and workers, and she would like to become a member of cooperation network like this. And she was wondering how uh, an organization or, or crucial professionals that are committed to advance the conversation and to deliver quite similar uh, initiatives that the one you presented, how, how do you do that? So I guess it's a question for, for all of you. Maybe I can start. So um, there is the European Disability Arts Cluster out, which is like a huge network um, from organizations, freelancing, artists, individuals. Um, so a lot of people I see in the, um, in the Zoom are already in this cluster. And this is a great opportunity for networking, of sharing knowledge, and it's now organized by European Access. Um, and so it's also like in a transformation um, process at the moment. But I think this is, um, I would say, on international level, the best network um, you can be part of it. And I guess it's not a big problem to send the information also then in the in the sheet and to become part of it. So we are meeting every, uh, I would say, three months. Maria, just tell me if I say anything wrong. And so it's really uh, informal and um, yeah, it's it's great. It's really um, wonderful and really impactful. Yes, Maria. I would also add, because uh, CARE is Italian, uh, to look also for uh, national organizations that can then help also connect to international organizations. And the first one that comes to mind in Italy is Aldiqua, the association, perhaps the first association created by disabled artists themselves. So that's also a good uh, reference, I think, CARE. Wonderful. Thank you for this, um, uh, for this, um, this advice. I uh, would say that um, uh, we will also include a link towards um, uh, a series of resources that exist online, including uh, um, a database of existing active organizations um, working already on these issues. Um, we had a couple of other comments, including one uh, from Billy Alvin, who was... Um, um, uh, who was uh, uh, commenting that we we talk uh, of course a lot about the accessibility for artists uh, to to performance spaces or, or cultural venues but we didn't uh, touch a lot on the access issues for audiences um and i guess uh, i mean this one is is more 
um, uh, uh, connected to the very theme of the um, of the webinar that is focusing on the the mobility, the international and cross border mobility of artists and cultural professionals, as it is really the the focus of this webinar. But of course, uh, and I guess this is something we heard a lot from the speakers that. Uh, there is a, an artificial dimension to focus only on the international trajectory of artists and, and professionals, as we know that many of the access issues, uh, opportunity uh, uh, available for, for artists and workers are very much connected to national or local realities and, um, and the infrastructure, but also the structural weaknesses that exist in every context around the globe. Um, so I hope and I guess uh, we, will, uh, we will be proposing other conversations and other formats also to investigate um, the access uh, for audiences. And uh, I see Ben Evans being uh, a part of this, um, our, our morning conversation, um, also posting um, the website of the European Access uh, Project. Um, in the Time to Work studies, uh, we spent quite a lot of time actually to, to reviewing and studying the access issues for disabled audience members. So um, I guess um, the Time to Work studies will be also a source of um, information, but also of conversation uh, to, to investigate this further. Um, I don't see more uh questions or comments um i see that uh, some of the participants are posting more um uh, resources and links which i i find it fantastic because it shows that in many countries you have guidance that is available uh in several languages which is also something that came up very often in the conversation. Um, sometimes the guidance or the material, uh, the technical, I mean, the writers, et cetera, are not uh, accessible in several languages. So um, it's, um, it's good uh, that uh, we share um, guidance um, uh, open to, to, to more uh, context. Uh, Jordi, um do you still have um, a last word you want to, to add um yeah i might i might just start because uh, one of the comments that has been in the chat for from uh, eva de Brecheni, who was saying that uh, she thinks the more we provide accessible programs the more people with special needs will feel motivated to participate and she argues that she sees this as a process and believes that it is up to organizations to propose first and then uh, the artists and audiences will be encouraged to join these initiatives. And she also echoes the feeling uh, which uh, our speakers have also highlighted that there is a demand, even if sometimes it's invisible on behalf of cultural workers and audiences with special needs, but we don't necessarily have the decision in our hands. And then she's wondering how we can encourage organizations to become more accessible and inclusive other than by laws. So what are the other uh, elements that can accelerate or facilitate this change? And I don't know if uh, uh, Sogni, Lisette or, or Maria would like to, to respond to that. I could share with you perhaps that uh, the National Theatre in Lisbon is undergoing works now in order to become more accessible in backstage offices, etc. Uh, and it was not only a surprise, it was so exciting to hear the architect that is responsible for that work saying, we are going beyond the law. And that's, that's amazing because all of us in the field, actually, it doesn't matter what the law says. Once you become aware of how many people you exclude because of the decisions you make every day, because of you, the way we build the world, the world around us, uh, then we start working on it. And it doesn't matter if it's in the law or not. That's what we want to do. We want to be together. We want to work together. We want to be in performances together. Uh, and that, again, I associate, I'm sorry, I think I'm repeating myself, but to knowledge, knowledge. We need to know, knowledge and awareness. 
we need to know what the barriers are and work around them. Thank you. Maybe I can add, so I completely agree with Maria, and we have like the law already out there. So there is like the UN uh, Disability Convention and um, and in the most countries, there are also national laws. So we have the law. Um, what I would like to see is um, a change in the funding structure so that if you are working more inclusive, if you are working towards accessibility, that you um, benefit from more funding, but that you also, for example, um, are judged by priority. So I think this could make a big change. So there, I see um, a big uh, responsibility from funding, um, uh, funding companies, um, state state funding programs that they should um, judge uh, cultural organizations who are really putting in effort and engagement and accessibility and priority. So this is just my, my opinion, um, but this could change a lot. I could jam in quickly as well um, to add on a little bit on that. I think that one of one of the things maybe it's di difficult to make it work, but you know the tax on entertainment it kind of really uh, hurt the artists who perform sell the ticket, and then we on top of that to pay for the tax on the ticket and tax on entertainment. Especially when we do like um, disabled artists who do the show the income itself because we not uh, generate money for private business we generate money for kind of ngo social enterprise tax in terms of um, tax uh, aspect it kind of killing the income from from the artists with disability who are trying to make a living from the with the professional so i i, I know it's going to be hard a different country and different policy but for my perspective, it really take away a lot of, you know, uh, gut from us when we are trying to find money to then generate for the artists, but then we have to pay quite a huge amount of tax as well at the same time. I'm not quite sure that policy is going to be uh, adapt or change, but that one thing might be help for disability artists when they sell a ticket and sell their work. Maybe some way it is considering kind of tax assumptions or a bit more friendly on tax on that. And my idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Just before giving back the floor to to Johan, uh, just a final final word from me. First, to thank uh, Onamu for putting this uh, all together and for disseminating the event and and for collecting so many resources uh, on the chat. And as uh, Johan was saying, this will also be the floor, uh, the, the basis of an info sheet. So that will give us quite a, a bit of uh, food for, for learning and for and for thought. Thanks to everyone for uh, attending the, the event and, and for sharing lots of ideas and resources on the chat as well. I was just now seeing the message from Irena from the Balkan Museum Access uh, Group. Uh, the, the information that Ben Evans uh, shared about the forthcoming call of uh, Europe Beyond Access, the open call for co-productions coming up uh, next week. Uh, I mean, there was also, if you haven't seen, there's a message from Ruben Burgam asking for colleagues active in fine and visual arts. So if someone wants to share that you can also reply to to his message. And then the thought from Billy Olwen on the potential of just putting an integrated company on, on stage and how that contributes to transforming audiences and transforming the, the mindset. So uh, yeah, just a few final thoughts. And yeah, thanks everyone for, for being here. It's been a pleasure, lots of 
good experiences and lots of things to learn and will definitely uh, hopefully this this provides a lot of opportunities for us to continue uh, learning and to improve uh, the practice on the basis of everything that has been shared so thanks uh, a lot and, and johan uh, thanks yeah thanks to the speakers and johan now the, the floor is yours yeah, thank you very much, Jorty. I think what you say is, is so true. It is very inspiring to see all the initiatives that are taking place and tackling a lot of different issues at the same time. Uh, it feels like we are active at targeting different elements of our value chain and from education to uh, uh, the funding system and the infrastructure, but also working with uh, all these gatekeepers, you know, in charge of uh, cultural institutions and in charge of uh, selecting artists, in charge of supporting them through different opportunities. So it feels like, um, um, I mean, the, the takeaways that I have from this conversation is both that we act, of course, uh, towards the policymakers and try to change the frameworks uh, we operate in. But I, I felt from the conversation, we'll all have a responsibility to train ourselves, to open our own minds, and that the cultural players play a big part in changing the mindset and, and the actual reality of our cultural field. Um, from, the, from the conversation also, I see that the training aspect is so important, not only for the soft skill, but also for the hard skills, like the how to, and how we collectively walk the talk. And I like very much this idea that we, we need to develop um, uh, further our, our training abilities capabilities and opportunities. Um, so for On The Move, I can say this, that we will continue to advocate for equal access, uh, especially equal access to cross-border mobility for disabled artists and, and professionals. I think this webinar is just another step in our collective journey uh, to collect examples to collect messages but also to channel them and to channel policy recommendations to many stakeholders in our field um, in particular we will be publishing at the end of june a new cultural mobility flows report on this particular topic uh, with the contribution of uh, George Di Balta and another colleague, Sophie Doden. And I'm very much looking forward to elaborate on, uh, on this, um, I mean, to elaborate further, I mean, to use all these takeaways from today's conversation and integrate them in, in our report. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Jordi, but also Lisette, uh, Onsogni, Maria Vlahu, for this conversation because you brought so many interesting examples and, and we could measure the progress. I know there's still a lot to do, obviously, but uh, it is also very positive and inspiring to see all the progress that were made these past years. So thank you for everybody also for your active participation. Um, you know that this web webinar will be accessible very soon on our YouTube channel and on a uh, whole round. Um, uh, we would like to post in the chat a very, very quick evaluation form so we can collect your feedback also, not only on the content, but also on the format and to collect further you know, ideas and recommendations uh, or resources that you, you might want to, to share with us. Of course, I can only uh, encourage you to, to subscribe to On The Move newsletter to be also aware of not only the mobility opportunities, but also of the future webinars and publication we will do. And um, I want to thank my colleague Marie, uh, Marie Le Sour and uh, Bernardo Queiroz uh, for uh, contributing so actively to the management of the chat and posting and selecting uh, many resources that appear. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we will connect very soon. Thank you.